Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce that from this day forth, I will be running no more railroad games. In fact, I have resolved to only run a sandbox game for you. That, that sounds wonderful! <laughs> where, where, where's the sand? Holy crap, what a moron! Yeah, no kidding. You don't even have a clue what a sandbox game even is, do you? Of course I do! What, what, you guys all think I'm an idiot or something? Well, I'm not! And, and I'll prove it to you all by defining what a sandbox is. A sandbox game is a Dungeons & Dragons game that is played in a sandbox to maximize playtime by eliminating bathroom breaks. Holy crap! You are a moron! It's, it's okay. <laughs> Fat Cat sleeps in her litter box from time to time <laughs> for the same reason. Now, to help our wonderful barbarian understand, I propose that our dungeon master explain exactly what a sandbox game actually is. Well, sure, no, no problem. A sandbox game is where I do absolutely no prep work whatsoever, and you all just run around in the game world doing whatever you want. I don't know, that that sounds like a thinly veiled excuse for you not to have to prepare anything for our games. Indeed, that's not the definition of a sandbox game that I had in mind. Well, I'm the dungeon master, and my word is law. So you just put your pipe back in your mouth and be quiet. Now, we're all going to run a sandbox game my way, and you're all gonna like it. Oh, oh, oh goody, I'll, I'll go get the sand. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can use in your Dungeons & Dragons games. Today in the Layer, we're gonna be discussing sandbox games in D&D and the dreaded railroad game. And we'll be talking about another type of game, which I refer to as a linear game. Now, generally, when the topic of sandbox and railroad games comes up in D&D circles, whether it be on a subreddit or in videos here on YouTube, what you generally find is the talky-talky people painting a stark contrast between the sandbox and the railroad. And it's presented in an either or fashion. Either you run a sandbox game or you run a railroad game. And furthermore, almost without exception, sandbox games are painted in a radiant, resplendent light, being held up as the gold standard of how to run a D&D campaign. Pretentious and lofty examples are given. They wax on and off poetically about how amazing the sandbox game is. And then they talk about railroad games, and the lights dim, and the horror music is cued. The dread is practically palpable, and the examples given paint a gory, repugnant picture of how miserable such a game is for players. Finally, these talky-talky people give their final conclusion. Certainly a dungeon master must needs run a sandbox game, because what DM in their right mind would torture their players with a railroad game? And yet they fail to mention there is another way to run your D&D games for your players. And it is not either or. It is not sandbox or railroad. There is another option. So yeah, today we're gonna do a deep dive on this subject. We'll discuss misconceptions, pros and cons, how to run a sandbox, how not to run a sandbox, what a railroad actually is, and how to run something different. Now, before we jump in, I want to give a shameless plug for my Patreon PDF because it's really cool and you should check it out. Every single month, my patrons get a PDF full of Dungeon Master resources, such as adventure ideas, NPCs, villains, traps, puzzles, magic items, random tables, encounters, and entire fifth edition adventures complete with professional maps designed for use on virtual tabletops. I've assembled an entire team of contributors from idea generation to writing, to editing, to layout and design all with the goal of delivering a high quality, professional grade product to my patrons every single month. So if you want to reduce your prep time and increase the quality of your D&D game, click that link to my Patreon page down below. And now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. The Sandbox Game. All right, let's talk about the actual definition of a sandbox game first, shall we? It is a game in which the Dungeon Master prepares in advance lots of different things the players could do and then the players have the option of which thing they would like to do. You still 
prep the game. You still prep the adventures. You still present plot hooks. But the players decide what they want to do from a variety of things that you present to them. It's a really quite simple concept, actually. Sandbox misconceptions. All right, now let's talk about what people think a sandbox is. Well, at least what people that drone on and on and Reddit and other places seem to think a sandbox game is. The Dungeon Master plops the players down into a game world with nothing whatsoever prepared and asks them what they want to do. There are no adventures prepared, there are no plot hooks, it's just a wide open game world and you can choose your own adventure. Nope, nope. Games like that almost always suck. That's, that's not a sandbox. Misconception number two. A sandbox is the best way to run a game. This is not always true. It is not always the case that if you give them five different options, they're gonna be happy with that all the time and they're gonna love that type of game. Some players want direction and guidance on what they should do next. This reminds me of my Prince of the Apocalypse game that I ran a while ago. My players were extremely frustrated during a certain part of this game, trying to decide what to do, which dungeon, which adventure to go on next and they just wanted me to tell them clearly which adventure they were supposed to do next. And admittedly, this was a flaw in how that particular module was designed too, and I've ranted a little bit about this on my live stream, so I won't go into that today. Next misconception, sandbox games are low prep games. <laughs> the, the, the opposite is actually true. When I have run a true sandbox game, I usually have to prep a whole lot more than when I run other types of games. Okay, this, so example, uh, my Curse of Strahd game, I'm running it as a true sandbox, meaning that my players have various plot hooks, various things they could do, and they could go to any one of them at any point in time. So that means that there was a point in time when I didn't know what they were going to do and they hadn't told me, hey Luke, we're gonna go do this thing next that I had to prep several things. I had to prep Madame Eva, just in case they wanted to go there, even though they were avoiding talking to her for some reason. I had to prep Valaki and all of the events that happened in that town. I had to prep the Wizard of the Wines Winery and the Mad Mage. The, the one on the mountain side, not the whole module, the Mad Mage. That's not what I'm talking about. And sure, part of this is my own fault because I gave them the plot hooks for all those things. But I was running a sandbox and that's exactly the idea. I give them various plot hooks and they choose which one they want to go to, which means that I need to be ready to run those things if they go there. How to run a sandbox game. Okay, so we've, we've, we've established the essence of running a sandbox game is preparing a variety of adventures the players could go on and then giving them the choice of what they want to do. So clearly that's kind of the base fundamentals of how to run a sandbox. You can also ask your players if their characters have goals or things they would like to do, and then those could be adventures the group goes on. And this could be stuff based upon their backstories if they want, or it could be based upon a character goal of say doing X, Y, and Z and getting this special magic item or something. Just note that if these goals involve the entire group, they could be adventures that the entire group goes on. However, if the goals are individualistic in nature, they should be part of downtime activities. This is assuming, of course, that you run a group game and that you don't want to have one-on-one -on -one game sessions, which you could totally do if you have time and one player wants to do a special thing that doesn't involve the group. Just don't delay the rest of your games for your campaign because you're busy doing one-off sessions with that one player. Like this is something that I heard once. Somebody was telling a story about how back in the day, their dungeon master would sometimes take months to get the next adventure ready for a campaign. And in the meantime of getting that campaign ready, they'd be doing one-off game sessions with some of the other players. I'm sitting there, I'm just like, well, that's why it takes him months to get it ready for everybody else because he's doing one-off game sessions. I gotta calm down. Anyway, anyway, you give them a bunch of options and then based on what the players decide they want to do, you, the dungeon master, run that adventure for them. And here is the trick to do this without having to fully flesh out and prepare five or more adventures with no guarantee your players will even do them at all. In advance of the game session, you pitch to your players plot hooks for a handful of adventures and ask them which one they'd like to do next. Your 
players tell you which one they want to do, and then you go off and you prepare that adventure for them for the next game session. Now, this this is admittedly hard. In theory, this sounds perfect and flawless, but it is harder to do in person and in actuality than you would think. It's not always quite so clean and easy. I recently ran into a Curse of Strahd game, just a couple game sessions, no, the last game session, and uh, I didn't know what they wanted to do after they got done with the druids. And so I literally had to prep three different things for a game session. And wouldn't you know it, they did a fourth thing that I didn't prep. So I was <laughs> doing my best. For my Youngling campaign, for instance, what I do is I give them three different options that are actually adventures that I pull from modules that I think are pretty cool and I might want to run for them. And then they pick which one and then I go prep it. And it works really, really well for them. Now for my Ancient Dragon campaign that I run for my patrons, I control the plot hooks fairly well for that game. And those players are really good about picking a thing that they'll do next and then sticking with it. That group still has options about what they want to do, but I control them, they are fewer. And I would say that that is less of a sandbox game, in all honesty. You see, in my games, I prefer to integrate this element of player choice on what they want to do to one extent or another. In Curse of Strahd, it's fairly wide open. In my Ancient Dragon game, it's a little more controlled, but players still get to choose. So, so you could say that I, generally speaking, run sandbox games, but I try to avoid having to prep tons of different adventures all at once as much as possible. The pros of running a sandbox game. I mean, the first one is player choice. You're playing Players get to choose what they want to do. This empowers them. It makes them feel like they are playing the game, doing the things they want to do, not something that is being forced on them by the Dungeon Master. You get high player engagement. They're very interested in the game. They want to play the game. And the fun tends to remain pretty high in these sorts of games. Not, not that it's necessarily lower in other types of games, just, just saying. Players don't feel like they are being forced to do an adventure they don't want to do. When players choose, they tend to enjoy things more. The cons of running a sandbox. <laughs> the, the, there is no guarantee that the campaign will follow the storyline the Dungeon Master may have in mind. The Dungeon Master can guide things by the plot hooks they give their players, but when players have choice, they might decide to do something that takes the game session, the campaign, in a little bit different direction than the Dungeon Master might have intended. Now, some people will consider this a con, some will think it is a benefit. I actually think this is a benefit. You see, sometimes my bright ideas kind of suck, or I might get bored with my own campaign arc. So when the players take things in a little bit different direction that they might be more personally interested in, and I prep adventures along those lines, well, then that is fresh for them, they like it, and it might be spicing things up for me and getting me away from something that I was getting a little bored with. The next con is that more prep work is usually involved. Now, a DM can minimize the additional prep work, but at the very least, you're going to need to prepare additional plot hooks and adventure ideas for your players to choose from. <laughs> and in some cases, like my Curse of Strahd game, you may end up preparing multiple adventures at once. The Railroad Game! All right, first things first, let's start it with a definition of a railroad game. It is a game where the players are not only forced to go on certain adventures, but the manner in which they complete the adventure is determined for them and they cannot deviate from it. The DM has a specific thing in mind for how things will go, and the players must stick to that. For example, the only way to defeat the orc chieftain is to storm his castle, kill all the orcs inside it, and then confront the chieftain in a final battle. The option to sneak in at night is denied to the players with the DM giving excuses for why they can't do that. The option to sow dissent in the ranks over time, possibly causing half the orcs to rebel, is denied the players. You see, in a railroad game, the dungeon master doesn't just present a situation to the players the orc chieftain must be dealt with, but they also determine how the players must deal with and overcome the situation. The essence of a railroad game is denying player choices in all aspects of the game, Player choices and decisions don't matter. The Dungeon Master decides in advance what the story will be, and the players are on a forced march along that storyline no matter what. Consequently, railroad games often feel like the Dungeon Master is writing a book instead of running a game. Railroad Misconceptions now, there are lots of things that are not railroads, but that people label as railroads in an attempt to disparage certain sorts of games. This happens with modules, which people will claim as railroads. 
They're not, they're linear games. It's almost like people think that if they can attach the negative label of railroad to something, even if it doesn't fit, they can just win the argument and pish posh a certain type of game away. So there, so there is this trend out there to do that and it's rather dumb. And here's the biggest misconception. A railroad game is when players don't get to choose which adventure to go on. That is not a railroad game. That is what we call a linear game, and I'll get to that in a second. I feel like lots of people say railroad when what they really mean is linear. But railroad has this negative connotation to it, and we love to just smear its name into the dirt for good reason but they misapply that term to things that are not railroads at all. Next misconception, railroad games are always bad. <laughs> yes, a true railroad game is almost always far less enjoyable than a game that's not a railroad. However, <laughs> if what you really mean by railroad game is linear game, then no, they aren't always bad. I've run lots of linear games over the years, and my players have had tons of fun playing in those games. How to run a railroad. No, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you how to run one. That, that'd be like making a video about how to burn your house down. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. If a DM runs a railroad game, it's not going to be because I told them how. My advice is to steer clear of a true railroad. However, a linear game can be a very good thing. So let's talk about that. The linear game. Okay, first let's define what a linear game is. A linear game is when the dungeon master decides, based on the storyline, what the next adventure the players will go on will be. However, the Dungeon Master still presents the situation of the adventure and then gives the players the freedom to determine how they will overcome that situation. Frontal assault, sneak in at night, cause dissension in the ranks, etc., etc., etc. Many, if not most, D&D modules are designed this way to be linear games. Waterdeep Dragon Heist, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Descent into Avernus, etc, etc, etc. And I would argue that even modules build as open world or sandboxy, such as Curse of Strahd, are still linear games at their heart because all of the adventures in those modules are still designed for specific levels. The levels the adventures are designed for suggests the order in which they should be run, unless the dungeon master does some home brewery to adjust them for different levels. Which, which is exactly what I do for my Curse of Strahd game, by the way. And to be clear, modules are not railroads either. They are linear games. Linear game misconceptions. Linear games are railroads. Nope, it's not true. I already discussed this, so I'm not gonna repeat myself. Linear games are bad and not fun for players. This is not true at all. Absolutely not true for years as a dungeon master. In fact, most of my games when I first started running fifth edition were linear games. And my players had tons of fun. They kept coming back to the game sessions for more and player turnover was very low, which is by the way, how you know your players are having fun in your games. If they keep coming back for, to play some more D&D with you, then they're probably having fun. However, when you have players who are frequently leaving and they don't come back, that's probably a sign that they're not having very much fun. Next misconception. Dungeon Masters should avoid linear games and try to run sandboxes instead. No, not necessarily. Linear games have their place. For instance, linear games are excellent for new Dungeon Masters just learning the ropes because they're so much easier to run from the Dungeon Masters viewpoint. And obviously linear games are great for modules because it's hard to run a module that isn't linear unless you want to do lots of customization as a Dungeon Master, which, which is fine if you want to do that. Even experienced Dungeon Masters might choose to run a linear linear game, and there's nothing wrong with that decision. How to run a linear game. It, this is pretty easy. You simply present one plot hook to your players for the next adventure they are intended to go on, and then you run that adventure for them. I, I mean, make sure it's interesting, make sure it's something that will appeal to your player's play style and preferences. You don't, you don't wanna just present it in a very cold, heartless way that says, this is the thing you gotta go do, go do it now. And you want to present a variety of different types of adventures over the course of the campaign 
game, so players don't feel like they're always doing the same thing, only with different monsters and flavor text. So you want to have rescue missions, stealth missions, diplomacy missions, sabotage missions, frontal assault missions, assassination missions, and so on and so forth. Then when that adventure is over, you present the next plot hook for the next adventure and you rinse and repeat. The pros of running a linear game. The biggest pro here is that you can plan out the adventures in advance, like actually detail them out and create the adventures with little fear of that work being wasted. In fact, I did this for years, planning out one or two adventures in advance when I had time. I would crack a couple adventures out and that reduced my prep time for the next couple months. Running linear adventures in general reduces prep time and it allows you to run a module with minimal rework. And, and honestly, it's an easier way for a dungeon master to approach running a D&D campaign, which is why I recommend linear campaigns for beginner dungeon masters. The cons of running a linear game. I mean, the first big con is that it limits player choice. In general, the more player choice you can add to the game, the better. So when you limit it, it that's, that is a drawback. And your players might not like the adventures you plan out for them. I mean, it's gonna happen. But but if they're able to choose from a selection, you have a better shot at running an adventure that appeals to them. And when you, the Dungeon Master, choose what adventure you're going to create and then they have to kind of run that thing, there is more pressure on you to create an adventure that appeals to them and that they will enjoy. What does Luke recommend? Beginner Dungeon Master should really consider starting out with linear games. It's going to make your life easier. I mean, you're, you're trying to get a handle on lots of things as a new Dungeon Master. And my advice is to learn the basics first before you try to push on to more advanced techniques like running a sandbox game. And then as you gain experience and move from a beginner to an intermediate, I suggest shifting to a more sandbox style of game where players get to choose which adventures they go on next. Advanced Dungeon Masters, Come on, you, you don't need me to tell you what to do. You have the wisdom and the experience gained from years of running the game. You do what's best for you and your players. Don't forget to check out my Patreon page at the link below for monthly PDFs filled with Dungeon Master resources, such as magic items, NPCs, and even entire D&D adventures. Remember too that this monthly PDF is just one of the many benefits my patrons receive. You also get access to a VIP Discord channel, can vote on which videos I make, and have a monthly video hangout with me. If you thought this video was better than the ads you had to watch to get here, give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let YouTube know that I don't completely suck. Next week, I'll be discussing the adventuring day mechanic and why you should be using it in your games. But until then, click right here to learn how to run an event-based D&D game. And until next time, let's play D&D!